Nowadays, cameras have so many different settings and functions, and photography is so much more complicated than it was when I started back in 2011. This is even more true when you consider video, because now these cameras, most of them have high-end video features. And the demand now for video is so high that most photographers are also expected to be videographers. But what I love about Fuji, in particular the Fujifilm X-T5, is that paired up with a couple of really nice prime lenses, this camera just gets me back to enjoying photography for the right reasons. Which for me is capturing moments, beautiful colour, light and shape, and capturing memories. And to do this really shouldn't be so complicated. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about sort of my overall philosophy when it comes to camera settings and some of the most important camera settings that I change in the Fuji X-T5 to get the shooting experience that I'm after. So just to reiterate, this is not going to be a video going through every single feature and function of the menu of the X-T5. There are plenty of other videos on the internet that do just that, but instead this is going to focus on the most important camera settings to me to achieve those simple goals. So first up, let's talk about the image format. So I actually shoot RAW plus JPEG. And the reason that I shoot both is to have access to the different aspect ratios within the camera. So if you're shooting RAW only, it's going to be three by two or two by three. But if you select RAW plus JPEG, you have access to to these others and the one in particular that I like to select is 4x5. So I will preview all of my images as I'm shooting in 4x5 and because I like to post my work to Instagram, Instagram is limited to a 4x5 aspect ratio so that just means I get a live preview in the back of the camera which is great. There's nothing worse than taking a photo that you're really really happy with and then going to post it on Instagram to show it off to your friends and followers and having to crop the top and bottom off. The great thing about RAW is that you can revert the image to the 2 by 3 aspect ratio. It still captures the entire sensor, but you get to compose in 4 by 5 I do use lossless compressed as the format, not completely uncompressed. I found that the image quality does not suffer at all with the lossless compressed format, and it does help you to save quite a lot of space on your SD card, and it means that you don't have to buy new hard drives every couple of months. The 40 megapixel sensor, while it is really sharp and detailed, does have quite large file sizes associated with it. When it comes to film simulations, I think they're really great and they're definitely an appealing part of the Fuji system. Definitely a big reason why a lot of photographers are choosing to pick up a Fujifilm camera. But for me, personally, I prefer to edit each and every individual RAW file that I shoot with this camera. And I use the presets that I've developed. I've found that I can just really get the look and feel that I want with those presets with the default Adobe RAW conversion. The film simulations do allow for quite a lot of customization with the JPEGs, you've got the tone curve and some color controls, but just not nearly as many controls as you get with editing RAW files. Now, of course, with this camera, you do have to choose a film simulation. You can't just have no film simulation, whether it's Provia, Astia, uh, Classic Chrome. For me, I like to choose a film simulation that is as close as possible to what the end result might look like after I've processed it with Lightroom. And for me, that is going to be ProNeg High. I think it gives a really good Good neutral tonality to the image, not too much saturation. And overall, I think the skin tones look really nice. I also do some shift to the tone curve, so I've got negative two highlights and negative one shadows. Now, just as a side note, the film simulation that you shoot in the camera, if you're going to be processing the RAW files in Lightroom or Capture One, doesn't actually matter. You can even change the film simulation in post-production, so you can pick an entirely different film simulation as your base if you'd like to. So while it is nice to preview your photos with that film simulation applied, it's not entirely necessary to pick the right one if you're shooting RAW. When it comes to the RAW and the JPEG, I actually save them to different cards as well. So for card slot one, I will have that fill up with raw files. Card slot two with JPEG. Generally, I will only back up the raw file card and I'll leave the JPEGs as a backup just in case something happens to that first card. I think it is also nice to have the option to have JPEGs just in case you need to offload some photos really quickly. Now, you might've also noticed in the menu that I have set my DR or dynamic range mode to DR200. Now, my 
understanding so far of the DR mode is that it does actually affect the RAW file and not just the JPEG. And to my knowledge with the dynamic range mode, I think what is happening here is some kind of exposure blending. So we're actually being forced into using a higher ISO. And I think what's happening here is we're applying that higher ISO to the shadows and the mids to make them a little brighter, but the lower ISO to the highlight sections of the photo, thereby giving a little more dynamic range overall. So if you've seen videos of mine where I've annotated the settings on the screen and you're wondering why I'm using ISO 250 instead of the native ISO of 125, that's why. And you're probably wondering why I don't use DR400 because obviously that would give even more dynamic range. And the reason is that that forces you into using ISO 500. Because I use mechanical shutter, the mechanical shutter is limited to 1 8,000th of a second. So with that higher ISO, it can make it a little harder to shoot wide open in bright situations. When it comes to white balance, I am using auto ambience priority, and I actually have it shifted towards sort of yellow magenta. So it's R2 B negative three. And I have it shifted that way, mainly for the preview on the back of the camera, just because I find that the auto white balance on Fuji tends to lean a little bit cool. And personally, I like to have slightly warmer images. A lot of people miss this little switch down here. It's kind of hidden, but this essentially lets you change your focusing mode. I am using AFC 99% of the time and I'm using the wide tracking mode. And what that allows me to do is use that point in the center of the camera, hover it over the area or the subject that I want to have in focus. And when I half press the shutter button, it's actually going to track that around the frame. So I can just focus and then recompose my shot. And then if I need to refocus on a different subject, just release the shutter button and half press once again. I've also got the eye autofocus on at all times. So when there is a person in the frame, it will focus on the eye that's closest to the camera. And when there's no person detected in the frame, it will revert back to that wide tracking mode that I showed earlier. And for me, this is just a great cover all setting in the camera. And I very rarely have to play around with my autofocus settings. In terms of the AFC custom settings, I just have that set to one multi-purpose and I've found that that works great. When it comes to the drive mode, I'm using single or continuous low depending on the situation. So if I want to capture a very decisive moment, whether that's the moment that a wave crashes or if I'm photographing surfing or somebody running or walking towards the camera, generally I will use continuous low at around five frames per second. But if I'm just photographing static subjects or a portrait shoot, I will usually use single. I found that keeping the camera on continuous low can be okay. So when you've got your finger pressed on the shutter, it will just continue taking photos. But honestly, recently my goal has been to take less photos overall. So I find myself switching back to single as often as I can, or at least when I remember to. As I alluded to earlier, I do use mechanical shutter as my shutter mode. And I use mechanical shutter over the electronic shutter because it does eliminate any banding if you're shooting under fluorescent lighting. And also you avoid rolling shutter artifacts when you're shooting fast moving subjects. One other important setting that I have is the auto rotate on playback. So I like to have this turned on so that photo shot in a portrait orientation are automatically rotated so that you don't have to keep rotating the camera in order to preview images that have a different orientation. And I also have a custom file name set up for my XT5. And this is just so that I can quickly identify which files were taken by which camera. And it just helps with avoiding duplicate file names, especially if you're sharing footage or photos from other photographers on the same shoot. So I've chosen to customize the name to XT5X and then the file name. When it comes to setting up custom buttons on this camera, I'm just really trying to keep it simple. And so I haven't done a lot of customization, but what I will talk about is how I have the camera set up just for changing my settings. So ISO, aperture and shutter speed. And I prefer not to use these dials on top of the camera. I really like them. I think they look really cool. They have a nice clicking feeling to them. 
However, in order to change the settings, you do have to move your hand around the camera like this. And I prefer just to use the dials on the front and rear of the camera because your fingers are already there. It also means you don't have to take your eye away from the camera to look at the dials. So I have the rear dial set to change my shutter speed, the front dial set to change my ISO, and then I just use the aperture ring on the lens to select my aperture. And for me, this works really great. Generally, I'm shooting in completely manual mode, so I will be choosing all three settings, shutter speed, aperture, ISO, all myself depending on the exposure that I'm trying to get. Now, when it comes to the actual shooting display, so what is shown on the screen while I'm taking photographs, I do also like to keep this quite minimalistic as well and only have the information shown that I really need. So in the screen settings, if you go to display custom setting, in here I have everything switched off except for focus frame, shooting mode, aperture shutter speed ISO, the focus mode, the flash, the frames remaining on the card, the mic level, the no memory card warning, and the battery level. One last thing, I have the autofocus beep turned off. For me, I just like to draw as little attention to myself as possible, so turning that beep off helps to stay a little bit more inconspicuous. If I did miss out on anything, or if you guys have any questions, anything specific that you want to know about other settings that I may not have talked about, just leave them down in the comments section below, and I'll try to help out as many people as I can. But I hope you guys enjoyed this video, I hope you got something out of it. If you did, please leave a like down below, and consider subscribing if you haven't already really helps me out a lot and I want to thank you guys once again for sticking around and I'll see you in the next video